Welcome back. I'm Chris Moore with HVAC Pro Blog, and this week I'm excited to share part two of a three part series on verifying refrigerant charge in residential HVAC systems. If you missed part one, we released that last week. Make sure you watch it so we can pick up where we left off. Without further ado, here's how to diagnose undercharged and overcharged refrigerant systems. So let's move along. So if you guys can see here, remember that visual I was talking about? If you add refrigerant and you get a balanced charge system, what you'll find is the superheat is going to be somewhat balanced with the subcooling. So in this idea here, you can see the target subcooling for this TX valve was 10. This particular older system had a target TX V of, of superheat um, as high as 20. But you can see there's liquid halfway up the evaporator, there's liquid halfway up the condenser, it's a balanced system, and this system's gonna operate efficiently. Really simple, obviously we don't need to add or remove refrigerant to this unit. And keep, keep in mind here, the, the subcooling could be as low as seven or as high as 13, and this system will still pass manufacturer specs and operate efficiently. What I can say though, is if you have a micro-channel coil, adding a little bit of refrigerant, you could be a half an ounce to an ounce. I mean, it's amazing how fast the subcooling stacks up and changes because there's just not a lot of volume of refrigerant in the condenser. That's why you have a lot lower subcooling values in those condensers, okay? So really important, go slow and watch the system as you add ounces of refrigerant. So we have a TX valve in this particular example. The valve is maintaining the correct superheat, 20 degrees for this, but you can see our subcooling is as low as zero to two. I would start adding refrigerant in order to get that bucket to start to fill. And in this case, we wanna get close to seven, eight or so and stop. Because then as the system runs, we're gonna to continue to subcool that liquid and it's gonna to start to uh, rise up and get really close to 10. So you, when you add refrigerant, you wanna to go to the low end tolerance and then stop and wait a few minutes because it's gonna to start to then subcool the liquid and you're gonna get really close to your target, all right? If I was to go to 10, it's really easy to overcharge it, then it would start to climb and creep. It could be 13, 14, 15, all right? Really important, if you stop at the low end, you're always gonna have a properly charged unit. All right, and then you only do this once. This is what it typically looks like on um, electronic gauges, right? You can see your superheat's okay. In this case, I have low subcooling. Um, if the target superheat was 11, right, um, and I have low subcooling, how would I fix this with a TX valve? Um, I would start to add refrigerant, make sure the valve continues to maintain the right superheat, and my subcooling starts to rise, okay? Really simple, just like the previous screen I showed you. All right, so let's uh, look at what, what it looks like with a fixed orifice and it's undercharged. Um, because you have a fixed orifice instead of that valve in this picture, uh, it's gonna start to flash off really fast because we're not stacking up any liquid in that, uh, in that coil. And it's gonna flash off really fast and it's gonna have a really high superheat because we're actually gonna continue to pick up heat after it flashes off past saturation and much more surface area now for that coil. So in this case, we could have as high as 30 degrees of superheat and we'll have really low subcooling. So because of that, as I add refrigerant here with that fixed orifice, the superheat starts to go down as, as it goes up, right? And the subcooling starts to rise. Um, so superheat goes down, subcooling goes up, and we get to more closer to a balanced system. So I'm watching the superheat as I'm adding refrigerant with that fixed orifice, but I'm also verifying that my subcooling starting to rise because if it goes at really crazy, I got other things going on. I can't just continue to get the superheat right and overcharge the heck out of that unit, right? Kill a compressor. So you have to look at both sides of the system. In this example here, you can see um, when we add refrigerant to an already sufficiently charged unit, I gotta ask you guys, think about this. Where does the refrigerant go? It's gotta go somewhere, right? The system's already charged, but somebody says, oh, those pressures look a little low, I'm gonna add some. I'll, I'll take care of you, Mrs. Jones, right? And they put another pound or two in. Um, it's going somewhere, and I'll tell you right now, if you have a TX valve particularly, it's stacking up in the condenser. The valve will probably protect that compressor and make sure you maintain superheat. It's really simple to start slugging that compressor if you have a fixed orifice though. So the refrigerant that's overcharged starts to back up with the condenser. And now what happens is it reduces the desuperheating area and the condensing area because it's all stacked up with liquid. All right. And in order for, to compensate for that, your head pressure goes way up. 
And when that happens, it's because we have to have a bigger temperature difference across this little section of coil to reject the heat and get it below saturation, right? We have to remember, we have to uh, subcool that system. We have to condense the liquid, okay? If there's already all this stacked up liquid, we gotta do it in this tiny little area now and no wonder your head pressures to the roof. So typically that's a, a dead giveaway that something's going on. Either there's non-condensables or it's an overcharged system when your head pressure's that high, right? Uh, but you gotta look at both sides of the system. Maybe there's something else going on that you should look for. Just because you have high head pressure doesn't mean it's an overcharged system, right? This is what I was describing on that previous screen, the valves maintaining the right superheat, but we stacked all that liquid up, so now our head pressure goes way up and our subcooling's really high. The only way to get this back to balanced is to actually remove some of that subcooling, right? To get my refrigerant back, my, my subcooling back down closer to the target. And remember, just like when you add refrigerant, you go to the low end tolerance. If the target was 10 and we add refrigerant, we stop at seven to let it creep to 10. If I'm gonna take refrigerant out, I'm gonna start taking refrigerant out and I'm gonna stop at 13 and let it creep down to 10, okay? So, because always with a TX valve, you have a plus or minus three tolerance. So, superheat's okay and we have high subcooling. This is what it looks like on your gauges. That valve is maintaining a perfect nine degrees superheat, but my subcooling is 23 and a half. The only way to get it down is to take refrigerant out, okay? Overcharged with a fixed orifice. So, just like a valve, when you have a TX valve, when you have overcharge with a fixed orifice, you have really high subcooling, right? And really low superheat. We're gonna flood that evaporator and it's not gonna boil all the refrigerant off and we're getting dangerously close to zero degrees of superheat and it's gonna start slugging the compressor. The only way to get this up, the superheat to go up, is to remove refrigerant. And remember that tolerance. If the goal here is to get to 20 degrees of superheat, we take refrigerant out till it gets to 15, and then it's gonna start creeping up to, to 20, all right? As that happens, your subcooling should also come down, okay? Low superheat, high subcooling, notice it's opposite. Anytime it's opposite, low and high, high and low, you have a charge issue. In this case, low superheat, high subcooling, it's overcharged. Think about this, if you have the same indicators, high superheat, meaning let's say this TX valve is shut down or we have an undersized fixed orifice or there's a restriction. We can't get enough liquid into that coil. And if we have a fixed orifice that's too small or we have a restriction and you're trying to adjust the superheat and as you add refrigerant, your superheat's not going down, but your subcooling continues to rise, you most likely have some sort of restriction. It could be all kinds of things, right, causing this. Maybe they didn't, um, one of the most popular things, they didn't run nitrogen through the line set when they were brazing. And all that oxidation rushed in and just blocked that strainer at the TX valve. You know how many times this happens. Everybody blames the valve. You know, valves do fail closed, but uh, I'm willing to bet it's probably full of junk. Um, and when you take it out and you put a new one in, of course the new valve is going to work. You just cleaned out all that oxidation that was inside the line set, right? So um, the key here is adding and removing refrigerant, it's not going to fix the problem. You got to fix the problem in this case, and that's the restriction. Bad valve, stuff in the strainer, undersized orifice, that's all restrictions. A kink pipe, I mean, who knows, right? Got to look for that though. And this is what it looks like on your digital gauges, right? In this case, uh, my target superheat was 17. I kept adding refrigerant, adding refrigerant, and you can see I got it to 17. It won't go any lower, but my subcooling keeps going up. I'm at 31 and a half degrees of subcooling here. That's why I said, you know what? I got to fix what's going on. And in this case, it was an undersized orifice in this particular job. This was years ago. Um, and we took out the orifice, put in a valve, Everything worked great, right? So high and high typically means a restriction. You gotta find the restriction. All right, what about low and low? Think about this. How could I flood the evaporator and have nothing left in the condenser, right? That's probably an oversized orifice or a valve that's wide open. Remember, TX valves fail closed, so it's not a bad valve. Maybe it's the, the sensing bulb, it's not mounted right or insulated. Um, there's a lot of situations where I see like ADP coils, they still ship them zip tied to that top ring in the coil. That's not where that's supposed to be mounted. That's just for shipping. You're supposed to disconnect it, mount it to the suction line coming into the coil, right? So low and low, just like high and high is not a charge problem. Low and low is a physical issue with the metering device most likely. I've seen systems with no metering device. I don't know how, how they operated 
very well at all. How it didn't kill the compressor, right? Definitely uh, take a look at the size orifice or the valve is uh, has a, mount, a bulb mounted correctly. And this is what it looks like on your on your gauges, right? Really low superheat, really low subcooling. As I take refrigerant out, my superheat would actually start to go up, but I don't have enough liquid to even make it to the evaporator at that point because my subcooling is going to keep going down. So the only way to fix this is to fix the metering device. All right. And this happens all the time. Uh, make sure when you're mounting these metering devices, you look at the installation instructions. Most manufacturers do not allow you to mount the bulb like it is on the left hand picture here. They want it on the right. They want the, the sensing bulb uh, capillary tube going into the top of the bulb if you're at, mounting it vertically like this. Ideally, it would be on a horizontal, but most people like to use street 90s right there to keep everything tight to that, that coil. So make sure you're mounting it correctly and insulating it correctly afterwards. I shouldn't be able to move it if you were to go out and, and do maintenance. If you move that bulb, you need to fix it, okay? And please, I mean, I understand why you wanna use the tire wrap, but that stuff sucks. All right, don't use that tire wrap. So what did you think? Did you like part two of the three-part series? If you like this video and you want more content like this, you can have access one year in advance by signing up for my Patreon page for as little as $8 a month. You'll get immediate access to written blogs and exclusive webinars released one year later. Be sure to come back next week where we talk about a non-invasive way that ACA has decided even HERS raters can use in order to verify refrigerant charge on new systems. I'm Chris with HVAC Pro Blog, where we provide advice for residential system design, quality installation, and system diagnosis. I'll see you soon.